gentlemen. Welcome to Cass Business School. I'm Stephen Haberman, Dean of the School. And um, look, the last time this room was as full as this, we had Mark Carney. Uh, I think you know who he is. And actually, the time before that it was as full as this, we had a discussion about Formula One. <laughs> so reinsurance is as sexy as Formula One. <laughs> It's a great pleasure to welcome you here this evening for the launch of Paula and her colleagues' book. Um, before we get on to that, just a few words about Cass Business School. Really, just a few words. And the thing I want to mention is a key part of our research strategy is the word impact. And when we talk about impact, we mean not just making an impact on the world of academia, because clearly that's very important to us, but making an impact on the world of professionals, practitioners, and policy makers. This is something that's really important to the school, it's really important to me personally, it's really important to CAS, we're not an ivory tower. Our aim is to transfer our knowledge, our expertise, to support business and solve real world problems. So it's in this context that I'm really delighted to welcome you here for the presentation of Paula's book, Making a Market for Acts of God. Authored by Cass Professor of Strategic Management, Paula Jasmikowski, but also with her two colleagues, Dr. Rebecca Bednarek and Dr. Paul Spiegel. The book is based on a three-year study of fundamental changes in the global reinsurance industry. I, I'm an actuary by profession, and I say that not as a confessing to you, but I should know about the reinsurance industry. I'm reading the book, and it's really fascinating. I'm learning a lot, not about models, but I'm learning a, a lot about how insurance markets, reinsurance markets really work. The authors, and indeed the school, are really delighted with the reception the book has received. It's an Amazon bestseller. It's raised a certain amount of uh, media attention and a lot of industry discussion about the implications of change for the world of reinsurance. And as you know, being mainly practitioners, as you know, this is a really critical industry that enables insurance companies to meet their claims and liabilities and enables society to rebuild itself after major disasters. On the word impact, Paula epitomizes what we look for in our leading professors at CAS. She's an excellent scholar. She's advancing theory in her field of study through a series of groundbreaking books and papers in leading journals. But at the same time, she works closely with and delivers research results for industry. She was recently, for example, the winner of the inaugural ESRC Prize for Outstanding Impact on Business. So that's enough from me. So let me just guide you through the evening. Paul is going to give a short presentation, 22 minutes, I understand, <laughs> precisely. And then she's going to hand over to a very experienced industry and academic panel who are going to make comments on her findings. And it gives me really great pleasure to welcome the three panelists this evening. Glenn Boo, Chairman of Euler Hermes, the largest credit insurer in the world. Tom Bolt, Director of Performance Management at Lloyds of London and Professor Mike Power, Professor of Accounting at LSE. <laughs> After the panel, there'll be a Q&A, and then we will go outside and over a glass of wine, continue the discussions and networking. So, that's it from me. I hand you over to Paula. Thank you very much. So thanks very much for being here. Uh, in order to get on with that 22 minutes, I'm just going to get stuck in because I'm sure you'd like to have some chance to ask some questions to hear what the panel thinks. Are you, is it a little loud? Are you getting a little much feedback? No? Okay, everyone's fine at the back there? Great. So what I'm going to do is take you on a journey or tell you a story of this industry as we observed it and we observed a market that worked, a market that was dealing in large-scale risks, the sorts of things that they call CNN events, you know, when major disasters happen, and that market was working and able to pay out. But some of the things that we observed, the changes that I'm going to talk to you about tonight, make us say that this market is moving from a market for acts of God to a market for commodities. 
Now, from a market's perspective, commodities are fine, but what are the implications of that for trading risk? And that's the things I'd like to show you this evening. Now, just to give you some idea of the science behind this, so you don't have to believe what we have to say, but you do at least have to accept that we've put some thorough effort into finding it out. Um, so basically what we do is we're ethnographers. What I like to say is that means I watch people work. So really, that's what we did. All around the world, my research team and I, for over three years, we observed underwriters sitting at their desk, climbing risks in London, Bermuda, continental Europe, Asia. We worked with 22 reinsurers around the world. We worked with three large broking firms. We actually worked with insurance firms, everything from tiny local firms in developing markets to some of the biggest multinationals in the world. And of course, because this is also a very social industry, we made our best effort to understand the social side of relationships. For example, I began the study in 2009 with 22 meetings at Monte Carlo. Some of those over glasses of champagne on sun drenched terraces. Rebecca was pledged to go to Christmas parties in winter in Zurich. Um, and uh, obviously I had to sink a few shots in Bermuda on New Year's Eve myself. So we really put ourselves out, for the out there for the research. And as a result, we're able to tell you something about how the industry works. So to give you an idea of what this uh, type of research does, it tells you what people actually do. So how markets actually work and the meanings that people give to what they do. So we're going beyond just sort of the economic function of the market, but what do they really do? And that's particularly important in a market like this, which we call a market for acts of God, because these are the kinds of unpredictable events. This is an event for the things that you can't predict, that are uncertain, but of high value. So to give you an idea, the Tohoku earthquake and tsunami, which I'm sure you all watched on your televisions in April of 2011, was an unmodeled or a beyond model event. The models had not predicted that an earthquake of that size could happen in Japan. Um, and of course, the value is always a tricky thing, isn't it? Because if an earthquake hits somewhere where there is no highly insured property, the sad story of the fall right now, then we don't need to have a big payout. But if it hits somewhere like Japan, if we have a, a you know, if the San Andreas fault actually happens, we're going to have a lot of very badly damaged property. So how do you work out what the value when it may or may not happen, and it may or may not happen in a high value area? So the point of this industry is that every risk that's traded all around the world is unique to that insurance company and it's individually tailored to their possible needs and losses. The other issue about this market is it's a market of high severity risks that don't happen very often. So the chances to learn and adjust your behaviour in a market like this are quite slow. So it's got to do something that's very important, very expensive, but with few chances to learn. In other words, it's absolutely critical for all of us who have policies, that a market like this is very stable. So let's show you how this industry has become so stable. Now, when I put up a graph like that, you don't think, oh yes, that's market stability for sure. If you see a, mark, uh, a graph like that, you typically think boom and bust or bubbles. But actually, this is one of the ways that this industry works. This is a simple little heuristic that was put up by Guy Carpenter, one of the major broking firms. It came out just as we were starting to watch this industry. I have to say, while we were watching this industry, that's gone down off here, so I didn't show you the rest of the graph. But when you look at this, what you're seeing is you get a spike in this industry after every major loss. In other words, after there's a major loss, prices on reinsurance deals go up. Now, this is based on something that's a tacit thing in the industry called payback. Okay, so any time that a risk has loss affected, so something, you know, it has some damage of some sort, after the fact, price goes up. It's a little bit like when you have an insurance policy, if you have a claim, then your insurance policy price goes up. But these are big products and the price goes up more. So actually, what we're getting when we see a cycle, a market that's full of hard cycles and soft cycles, and why do I claim that gives you stability, is it works in a market like this because it's hard to price the risk in advance. If nothing happens for 20 years, then quite frankly, anything you pay is too much, isn't it? So you've got to think that this is a cost to insurance companies to transfer some of their risk to another party and have to pay them for that. So as long as we don't have a loss, the prices go down. When we do have a loss, we get payback post loss, particularly if that loss is exceptional, surprising, or is a loss that shocks the entire market. Then the entire purse of the market will pay back, you know, so the market will pay back for for, for across the whole of the market to make up for the losses in one area. Now, 
This is not a contract. No one wrote that down. You can't say, well, come on, here it says in line 32, it's time for payback. This is one of those tacit behavioural norms where people know that that's the best way to keep mutual skin in the game. It stops the reinsurer from, but the reinsurer has an incentive not to suspend payment with long, lengthy court cases before they pay claims because they're about to renew a deal and they're going to get more money. So it's in their interest to pay the claims, get on with getting more money, let's keep the capital flowing and the industry working. The insurer has also got an incentive because for them, this, instead of shopping around for cheapest capital they can find after they've just lost a lot of money, they can pay their reinsurer back and they can keep trading in the market themselves. So actually what we have is a tacit way of stabilising the flow of capital over the long term through these peaks and troughs that you saw that in other market markets like boom and bust. Of course, this depends on relationships. This depends on long-term relationships that carry on over multiple cycles. So that's a key point of this market, and let's talk about what that's going to mean when we see what's happening in the changes. The other thing that's quite important about this market is the issue of price discovery. So how do you know what a risk should cost? If it doesn't happen, or if you don't know if it's going to happen, and you don't know if it's going to happen in the desert, or if it's going to happen in where the condos are, then how do you price for that kind of uncertainty? So the industry has come up with an interesting way of quoting and bearing risk collectively. So basically all the reinsurers in the market that are interested in a deal will get it separately and they will quote on that, they'll analyze it, and they'll put back a quote um, with the price that they're willing to pay or the willing, they're willing to accept and the share that they'd like. Now this is what happens then is you've got a load of possible prices for the risk. And from that, we know that we're not gonna take the lowest one because the chances are high that these other players won't take part of the risk. So if you take a very low price as an insurer, then you won't get enough people taking a share of your risk. And why do you want a lot of people to take a share of your risk? Why don't you just give it all to this bloke? Okay, who wants to take the whole lot and it's low priced. Well, say that that bloke is the person who insured 9-11, 40 billion of loss. Then maybe he doesn't have the capacity to, to withstand that shock. He collapses, you collapse. So it's more in your interest to actually spread your risk around a lot of reinsurers and let them work out what's the price they're willing to take it at. So this is a price discovery mechanism that actually acts very well in a market where you can't trust the model. When I say you can't trust the model, the model simply cannot predict <coughs> what we don't yet know how to predict. If they're saying this is a one in 500 event or a one in 1,000 event, A, we don't have a thousand years of data, and B, one in 1,000, you can still have two one year after another. So in that sense, this is a way of counteracting the uncertainty of the risk and the difficulties of using models for pricing. The other thing it does is it allows you to get a bit of a sense check from the rest of the market about, you know, we're all going to take the same price for this, so have we all got a bit of a feel for and respect for each other as, you know, skilled professionals? So what does this actually give us in this market? These processes I've described give us collective bearing of risk over the long term with a broad base of reinsurer-driven expertise. So for an insurer, rather than offering the deal at different prices for different people or trying to squeeze some people, you know, and, and push them for a lower price, what we end up with is if everyone's got the same terms and everyone's taking the deal on the same basis, I don't have to worry that some will pay and some won't. Good for the insurer. At the same time, it gives us some way of making sure that the expertise provides a sense check to models that possibly won't work or for unmodeled events. And so it is that we have a market that has evolved to work because of cultural norms of mutual skin in the game. So those highs and lows in the cycle are actually a way of keeping mutual skin in the game. Insurers and reinsurers are actually in the same process here, they both need to survive. So we have collective pricing, we have uh, collective bearing of risk, we have, yes, contracts, of course this is all contractually based, but we have relationships that sit alongside the contract because these are acts of God. And so under those circumstances, we can't specify precisely how it's going to happen. We need to be able to interpret the gray and keep trading through that. So this is how this market has worked despite unpredictable, uncertain, and increasingly severe losses. Uh, whether you believe in climate change or not, certainly at least the frequency and severity of losses is increasing as we have greater urbanization and exposed areas. So it's an important market. It's also on a market undergoing a lot of change. And what are these changes driven by? Well, many of them are driven by the fact that the buyers have changed. The insurance companies have become larger, multinationals. 
And as part of that consolidation, consolidation and globalization, some of them have actually been found too big to fail. Now, this increases the regulatory scrutiny of these uh, insurance companies, and as part of their responses, they need to be more careful and more understanding of their capital modeling. So, a combination of chop size, global purchasing, and the need to demonstrate capital efficiency have led to optimizing their spend on risk transfer. What do I mean by optimizing? Well, there's lots of details in the book, but let me give you one of the big ones. It's what we call bundling of risk. So in the past, and just to give you an example, one of the first companies to really take this big was a company called QBE, headquartered in Australia. Yes, I confess, my background too. Um, they became a very large multinational and decided in 2010 that it would parcel its risk around the world into just three, not five, but three major global products that it would put out. So instead of buying, you know, you've got Mexican risk, you buy a Mexican product. You've got French wind, you buy a French product. It said, let's take the whole lot, let's bundle it up and buy a global cover, multi-peril uh, and multi-territories. Now, in one way, that's very efficient, right? That makes good sense. And it also allows you to be very efficient with your capital because you say, in the past, you used to say, well, I need protection everywhere I am. Now you say, well, actually, it's pretty unlikely that Australia's gonna flood at the same time as Chile has an earthquake and so on. So because I've got risk in lots of places, I can cover myself. So bizarrely, based on this kind of scrutiny and optimization, the more risk they take around the world, the less of that risk they offset to other players. The more of it they hold for their own diversification. Now, some of the good sides of that is it gives them an enormous incentive to understand what's in their own portfolios. So that's a good side of things. These big multinationals really understand risk in some quite emerging and developing territories. The other thing that's very good about that is part of this is they keep more risk themselves, so they've got less costs to their company, drives costs down to shareholders, that's good, we know that we want companies to pay good dividends to their shareholders. It drives the cost down to the consumer, the policy holder, because they can have a, they can control the costs of insurance if they're not spending so much on reinsurance. So these are all the good things about this. There are some things though that make us say this is changing the norms. Is changing the norms bad? Well, I'll leave you to decide that, but let me tell you what changing the norms does. So for a start, these products are big. So think about AIG, a company that was in the news quite a lot after the financial crisis. Uh, it's putting out one, bit, one billion, one and a half billion global aggregates. Uh, so these are big products. Small reinsurers can't simply analyze a product like that. They, they, you know, this automatically says big needs to muscle up or get into bed with big. So what you have is increasingly a smaller pool of players taking the majority of the risk. To give you an idea, the QBE products that I talked about, 80% of those products went to three players in the market. Actually, 75% went to two players in the market and the other 5% to one other. So you can see that's quite different from the kind of collective risk bearing we were talking around the market before. Quite different from the collective ways or the price discovery mechanisms that we had. Basically, what we have is we're eroding the collective wisdom, we're shrinking the overall pool of reinsurers, and those reinsurers who are taking shares in risk like that, if you never did business in Asia before, and now you take a risk that has Asia in it, or Romanian earthquake in it, you don't know that area. You don't know how to appraise it. So you simply have to take the risk based on what the model says rather than your expertise. Oh, I got a bit excited there. Now, the other thing is that that product that uh, QBE developed, having taken so much time to develop it, doesn't want to do it every year, so it made it into a three-year product. Now, you can see that that automatically also destroys the cycle, because say you take a big hit on a three-year product in year one, you will not be getting payback in year two or year three. You have to wait three years to get your payback. So we're having a very different kind of set of mechanisms when we change it. And what we're actually saying is, this has changed the way that people think about what risk is. So if you're an insurer and you're, getting, you're taking some of your risk and transfer to someone else to help you pay claims in the event of a disaster, smaller insurers had a very local understanding. It's a fire in a factory near me. It's the homes of people like myself. So that's how they understood risk. Maybe they bought a little much, I can't say, but at least they thought very much about it as tangible and local. Now, here's the kinds of things people say. I've got risk all around the world, I buy my cover for it at my global headquarters, and I just put a number on all my risks. So this is the sort of thing people have said. 
You know, they rate it between one and 10, one is this, 10 is bankruptcy, we get an average, and the state of risk in my portfolio today is 4.2. Now, on the one hand, that's fantastic. On the other hand, you can see how that obscures what might be lying underneath. And it's fabulous if every single year, every single time you go into every risk to check that 4.2 is right. But what we know about numbers uh, is that typically the number becomes the proxy. So now we don't know we have 4.2, next year we can start for 4.2 and model from there. And I'll talk to you about some of the implications of that in other industries. Okay, at the same time and not causally related, we have had a set of products that have caused much interest in the media about our book which is what are called alternative reinsurance, uh, alternative risk transfer products. They've been called alternative in the past because reinsurance has always been a pretty closed industry, a dedicated group of people who deal in reinsurance products and hold capital specifically for the insurance industry. But of course there are capital markets out there that hold capital for, and trade capital for a range of reasons, and increasingly hedge funds and pension funds have flocked to this industry. Now initially in 1992, when a small number of these products came into this industry, it was because there was a very hard market after Hurricane Andrew, and insurers were desperate for some capital. But since 2012, these products have been growing apace, and we have not had a hard market. It's not because they're desperate to find some capital, these products have actually found a new space in the industry. And as part of that, we've got creep. So they are reportedly 10% uh, of the reinsurance premium in the industry now. They've gone beyond what they initially were with very specific discrete catastrophe on products which were largely for very modelable US property catastrophe. So the sorts of things we know a lot about like how many condos and mobile homes there are in Florida. Increasingly now you get catastrophe bonds in all sorts of situations. For example, the Mexican government is on its second issuance of catastrophe bonds and yet we wouldn't have said that was a highly modelled territory. At the same time, they've crept into alternative ways of getting to the industry, including partnering up with insurance firms to provide collateralised reinsurance. Now, on the one hand, this is a very good thing. This diversifies the pool of capital. If the insurers are getting so big and many of the reinsurers are still very small, why would you trust a small reinsurer with less diversification than you to manage capital to pay your losses? So you can go to these big companies, pension funds, that are putting only 2% of their entire portfolio into your industry. It's not, it's not correlating with their industry, and so you know the chances behind that they'll still be there after loss. It's also collateralised, the money's sitting in a special purpose vehicle. Therefore, we can assume that if a loss happens and it is triggered, it's sitting there waiting to pay. Uh, the other thing is it's coming at a very low cost in the current marketplace where we have low returns on investments, so it's driving prices down. That's going to be a good thing because it widens the pool of insured people. Okay, so developing countries can afford to buy products like this because they're actually a pretty low price. And that's all good because we want to spread the pool of insurance because market mechanisms are more likely to pay for loss than aid is likely to pay for loss. Okay, so why is this a problem then? Well, it may be a problem because it's changing the norms. It operates on a very different set of principles, these products. So for a start, there are very specific narrow products that specify a particular type of risk, set of parametrics on which they will be triggered. Now, if you can accurately measure exactly what your risk is, then this will be a very good product for you because you can know what it is, you can buy this product, and if that happens, this product will pay. Unfortunately, the problem is we're talking about market cracks of God. So does any of you in here know when the San Andreas fault is going to go and exactly which properties it's going to take out? Because if you do know that, you should certainly come up here and start making some money for the people in this room. Um, and one of the problems is that basically what we say about these products, very good products, if you hit the bullseye. Now this statement was actually made in relation at the time to the Tokyo, to the Tohoku earthquake, where there were bonds, in you know, there were bonds for catastrophe in Tokyo. The problem is those bonds didn't pay for the Tohoku earthquake, not because of anything that was illegal or fraudulent by the, uh, by the bondholders or the investors, but because they weren't triggered, because they weren't where the risk happened or where the disaster happened. So one of the problems is you're going to need to be able to measure very well if you move like this. And we've agreed that that's a hard industry to measure. Secondly, there isn't an incentive for relationship-based trading. The money's sitting there, it's in the collateralised product. There's no, if I pay you back, if I interpret the contract flexibly, we'll do business again next year, you're not exactly sure who it is you're dealing with. Um, and the other thing is, it drives prices down. Now, I know I said that that was a good thing, but that's also a bad thing because the whole point about this was that we used to have an incentive for payback. We used to have an incentive to settle claims fast. 
because you know people wanted to continue to trade. But if you're getting a very low price year after year after year for your risk, it makes good sense for you to get more specific, more precise, follow the norms of the new players who are selling that capital cheaply, and if you know you're not going to get back in the black, then you can't make exceptions anymore. So what it does is it changes the entire industry, not just the norms of the new players coming into the industry. So just to cap what I have said, I said we have a market that has worked over many generations because it has evolved a set of conditions that allow it to do so under slightly difficult non-normal market, uh, you know, non market characteristics. What we're seeing is a change in web of practices. So we're going from unpredictable and uncertain risk to specified and precise, from broad-based expertise spread around the industry in different areas to a narrow focus that increasingly predisposes what can we measure. We're going from a mutual game where insurers and reinsurers have a reason to look after each other and trade through the cycle to a transactional game. And as part of that, we're going from market cycle to lowest cost provider. Market cycles used to pay, we don't yet know if lowest cost provider pays. Um, now, I have drawn, and this certainly was picked up in the press, although I have to say we draw it in a couple of pages of what is a really fancy book, some possible cautionary tales. You cannot draw one-to-one -one correspondence between industries. Nonetheless, an excellent study was done by a sociologist of finance that looked at the subprime mortgage market. Now, to keep in mind, this man also predicted the LIBOR scandal. Nobody was listening, so he published it in 2007. In 2011, the market went back and said, all hail the genius. He saw this problem coming. So I just want to say, I don't know if I see this problem coming. Just because it hasn't happened yet doesn't mean these things can't happen. So what happened in this market was, for a start, subprime mortgages used to be dealt with by people who did asset mortgage back assets trading, excuse me, assets trading. So they really understood mortgages and they understood the big problem with subprime mortgages was default. As these products got bundled up into collateralized debt obligations, they moved to a different part of the bank that dealt with those types of, uh, of, of, of financial instruments. Now, those people didn't actually have expertise in drilling down into mortgages, but also, they changed the focus of the risk. So on the one hand, yes, people still understood the default was a problem with subprime mortgage, but there was also another problem. This was actually a risk that you wanted to sell to make money on, and prepayment was a non-attractive feature. So these subprime mortgages became very attractive products because prepayment is very unlikely with subprime. Naturally, keeping in mind that this is a risk and the default is a risk, they still had to have some sort of model figure for it. So they played a model correlation of what's the chance of all the subprime mortgages going at the same time? It's 0.3. Now, if it had been 0.5, those products would not have been viable. When the collapse actually, collapse actually happened, turned out the correlation was 0.8. In other words, the model was wrong by a significant error, and nobody who was dealing with those products understood the underlying risk anymore because they moved to a different group of people. Now, there are some other factors as well. I'm oversimplifying what is actually a 65 page article in the Journal of Sociology. I'm sure many of you would like to go and read that afterwards to check the facts and understand some of the other conditions. But what I am saying is when we start changing these tiny norms and the way that people attribute meaning to what they do, we might be changing our understanding that. This is about transferring a risk from you, a policyholder, to an insurance company who wants to help pay when something goes wrong and needs support from a capital market if a big thing happens and all the properties go at once. So what's the purpose of this market? To ensure payment in times of loss. At the moment, it's moving towards commodities, things that are measurable, tradable, and very sanitable. We assume that this risk can be sanitized. But actually, we are still dealing with acts of God, unpredictable, uncertain, and often severe, and in fact, as Stephen Slater would say, I would like to kill Donald Rumsfeld for unknown unknowns, but perhaps he was talking about this industry. And to give you just one quick example of what I mean by unknown unknown and how that can have a kind of domino effect, in 2011 there was a flood in Thailand. We didn't know that Thailand would flood, so actually it wasn't modelled loss because people didn't think that Asia, that severity of flood was a problem in Asia. The problem is it's a very fast developing market in Asia, so actually what had been rice paddies, which is why we didn't have a problem with flood, had turned into industrial plants. And as a result, those industrial plants, all of a sudden, instead of something we didn't know could, happening, could happen with any severity, just happening to some fairly low value rice paddies, we had a bunch of industrial plants around the, uh, 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 from key parties or key companies around the world that were underwater. The other, so that's one unknown, or two unknowns, if you like. The third unknown is we didn't know that the Japanese had a lot of those properties, 
that those industrial plants are because they have had a big earthquake earlier that year, they've shifted some of their manufacturing capacity to Thailand. So there's three unknowns connected one to the other. Oh, and then guess what? Because those things stayed underwater for three months, what happens is supply chains were disrupted. So we had contingent business interruption for companies that were in America. So actually we had four unknown unknowns all clicking into each other one one for another. Now actually the market coped with that really well. All I'm trying to say is that's one small discrete example of what I mean by the possibility that as norms change, you can have a set of connected losses that you didn't know were connected. That can accelerate. So just to finish, I'm now actually going to say, so what is the future of trading in reinsurance and in large scale risk? Because these things are here to say, I'm not saying these things are bad, but we need to work out what are the new norms and how can we be sure that we're going to have A, good effective markets, meaning things that trade at a profit, but also things that trade at a profit and can provide cover for your policy when you have a problem. So we're saying that we may be moving from access to commodities, the underlying risk remains the same. So I'd like to invite the panel up to talk to us about what they think are the implications of this. And so it gives me an enormous pleasure to invite them up, please do, and turn on your mic. Uh, so just to let you know, Mike Power is a board director of risk and regulation at uh, Central Risk and Regulation at LSE. He's a professor of accounting who actually pioneered this kind of practice way of looking at how we understand what accounting and risk actually how they really operate in the real world. He's also a non-executive director on a couple of investment funds. Uh, Tom Bolt, you may know, so Tom started his or spent a large chunk of his career at Berkshire, Berkshire Hathaway, um, you know, which I guess we all understand is a pretty important company in the insurance and reinsurance space and more widely in the capital market space. Now Tom has been for several years uh, the performance uh, director of performance management Lloyds of London, one of the oldest insurance and reinsurance markets in the world. He's not the oldest. <coughs> and Clem Booth, who is an industry veteran. Clem's been CEO of one of the large insurance firms. Clem's been on the buying side, uh, uh, on the selling side at Munich Re on the executive. He's been on the buying side at Allianz, one of the largest companies in the world. He's now chairman of Euler Hermes, even as he technically is retiring, I believe. <laughs> so let me just uh, stop the light on their faces and perhaps I could, um, why don't I ask them a couple of questions and then open up to you to ask some questions. So Claire, I think it'd be good if we could just talk about your most recent experiences as, a, as being on the buyer side. How do you see some of these changes affecting the norms? How do you feel about some of the new products? What are the norms they're going to operate on? And who's that going to be good for? Well, I think um, if I go back to 2006, when I, when I joined Allianz, um, I took a look at the reinsurance buying patterns for the previous 25 years um, and found out that except for one year, which was 2001, uh, for understandable reasons with 9-11, uh, in all of the other years, there was a five point spread uh, in favor of the reinsurance market for all seeded business, meaning that uh, Allianz seeded business that with the benefit of hindsight, leaving aside risk capital, uh, they should, for instance, be able to retain. So uh, we had a major discussion in the group around whether reinsurance was a form of capital or an instrument to protect the PL. And we came to the conclusion that we should regard it as a form of capital. And uh, fast forward nine years, um, risks that should have been retained from a volatility <coughs> standpoint, from a capital standpoint, were retained, and and uh, the the contribution of that activity to the market cap of Allianz, which is around 60 billion euros, is around 3 billion euros of market cap. So put another way, 3 billion of the market shifted from the insurers back into Allianz. So I think it represented a very fundamental shift in how we saw our role as a major risk carrier from a risk profile standpoint. There's not a lot of difference between the portfolio of an Allianz and the portfolio of a Munich Re from a risk standpoint. And from the perspective of, I mean, you've been one of the big players moving into the space. You're an early player in the cash bond market. You know, I mean, how do you see the, you know, how do you see your relationship with these people? Are these are attractive or a good product for you? Sure, it's uh, the real question about the, the capital markets um, are the underlying drivers. Uh, the main driver of 
securitization today is low interest rates. It's nothing to do really with uh, insurance being especially uh, attractive. It's more to do with the fact that putting your money in a bank today um, is distinctly unattractive. So, um, and, and, and not only from the point of view of return, as we saw in the financial crisis, potentially also uh, from the point of view of security. So, um, as an alternative asset class, um, the capital markets are interested, and yes, there's a place for that. Uh, the real question would be, what happens when that system is severely tested? Will they reinstate the capital? Because the, the capital markets in entering into uh, far removed risk areas almost make the assumption that the principle is not at risk. And, and, and we only have to go back to 2008 with, with the AIG's Financial Products Division, which principally operated on the same concept. It said, we've got to service this big obligation, but the lump sum, the, the, the nominal amount, that was not at risk. Turned out it was. So uh, I think there's a place for it, but I don't see it replacing conventional forms of risk transfer anytime soon. Thanks, Clem. I think we might hand on to the, uh, well, Lloyds of London has been on the buyer's side and the supply side for a very long time. The point about Lloyds is it's been built up over 300 years on a very strong relationship-based trading platform. And so I invite you, Tom, to talk a little bit about how you see some of these changes, because I know that you're also pushing very hard into the insurance and security, or at least exploring that very hard at the moment, as is the London market generally. Um, hopefully this doesn't create too much feedback. Um, we think, I guess if you look at a general trend, I think anything that could be commoditized will be, as long as the fixed income markets have such an unattractive feature, as Clem said. And so property cat would be a logical target, as it has been for folks to do, where a dollar cat limit is about the same from one person to the next. There's not as much ability to distinguish as there are in the more complex, complicated risk that Lloyd's often writes. And so if you think that things are going to be more commoditized, then you need to prepare yourself for a different way of trading. And I might uh, pass on an example. When I was in my formative years working for Bankers Trust, and we had an insurance derivatives business, and, and I was doing a two-factor option of, all in the Nikkei with a Tokyo Richter 7. So being the hot shot that I was, I walked across the trading floor, I hedged the yen risk with the yen guys, I hedged the Nikkei risk with the Nikkei guys. I had 25 million of limit I could take on our own balance sheets for the bank. The bank had given me um, on that one deal and I had to get 25 million of extra limit. So I went down the street to Lloyd's, I was here in London, and I said, I'm not trying to arbitrage you. I'll take net and unreinsured the same price in terms that you give me, but I need you to give me 25 million a limit to stand alongside our 25 million. And said, but I want to be fair with you. It's an institutional client. They're a money manager in Tokyo. I don't think there's going to be any continuity. I don't think there's going to be any payback. And for simple sake, let's just assume that there's no risk factor. And so this underwriter at Lloyd's, who was fairly prominent, said, let me get this straight. There's no continuity. I said, no continuity. No payback? No payback. No risk factor? No risk factor. He leaned across the desk. He says, we don't really do that here. <laughs> and, and my radio was jammed for at least two days. I couldn't figure out what, you know, I thought Lloyd's was the paragon of taking risk. And, and actually they are, but I also figured out what the deal was was he was selling risks or options that he didn't really know what the right price was. So he only sold them to friends and people who would trade with him into the future rather than some pot shot guy from Bankers Trust. So I think that tells you a lot about your comments earlier about the relationship aspects because if you're selling things, you don't really know what the right price is. And, and I'm a big pessimist about parameter risk in the model. The Northridge earthquake was on a fault that wasn't in the model. And so while models are helpful, incredibly helpful at telling you what your exposures are, they're not so predictive of what will happen in every chance. And I, I was talking to an underwriter at Lloyd's and said, you know, you're not the guy who's gonna make me use models, are you? And I said, well, you know, I'm pretty suspicious of models myself. I'm telling them about my fears about parameter risk. 
I said, but I look at a model as sort of a skeleton on which you can hang the rest of your underwriting thinking. And he, and he looked at me skeptically. He said, you know, so I'll, I'll grant you that skeleton is enough human, right? But a human without a skeleton isn't much of a human either. So you need both things to think about it and help adjust. Now, there seems to be a big faith in the model technology um, by the people who are doing things in the alternative cap markets and that, and, and fair do so find out if there's problems and where there's problems. But it's actually a slightly more complicated thing given the uncertainty around what the right price is and acting for a fluid market and trying to keep things going. But I think you would not benefit by thinking that the alternative market, you said 60 billion up there, that's not going away anytime soon. You know, the, I believe the capital behind the folks, behind the folks who provided the 60 billion, if you go to them and you say, I only want 1% of your assets under management, that's a $600 billion number. So I think there's plenty of room for them to stub their toe two or three times and still be in the game. And I think, so you have to decide what you're gonna do.
corporate governance. I mean, non-executive directors like me would have to probably have to work a bit harder trying to understand the nested relationalities which drive market behaviour rather than sitting in front of spreadsheets and uh, graphs about uh, um, traffic lights and that risk and so on. So, so that's one thing. The other really interesting thing, I think, is the is sort of your vignettes about the nature of competition, both being price competition but also cooperation around uh, taking sort of shares, shares in uh, different uh, risk positions. And I think uh, that sort of combination of competition and, and uh, cooperation is something that you know, economic sociologists have been very, very interested in. And so damn well should be regulators, uh, quite frankly. So, uh, because no one really operates in a, in, a, in a pure market. There needs to be some sort of cooperative basis for it. And I think you tell a, a really interesting story. Uh, uh, and if I may, I mean, we're just uh, two kind of concluding reflections. I mean, I think, I suppose one of the, the things that sort of didn't culturally get out of the book was uh, uh, the sense of co competition for capital within, within reinsurers. Uh, I mean, just thinking forward from the uh, risk-adjusted rate of returns on capital disciplines that came into banking in the 1980s, which created a, a whole sub-politics, I would have expected to kind of, I'm sure that's in play somewhere, in, in the story that you're telling, there's a competition between underwriters for, for different deals, albeit within the within existing um, portfolio. Um, as part of our work on risk culture in the financial services industry, uh, we went into various insurers, and um, at one of the insurers, uh, the chief risk officer was telling us about the culture there. He said, you know, our high rolling underwriters know that they can only do the stuff they do because someone else is doing the low yield, less glamorous and risky business. Uh, so there was some kind of collective sense of the portfolio distributed into the individual underwriters, that they had a sense of their collective responsibility, even though some of them were the superstars. How different from banking? <laughs> Thank you very much. That's three great uh, insights and some thoughts about both what the book has to offer, but also where the industry is going. Now, I know that some of you are very exercised about these issues because you've been exercising yourselves, uh, mm -hmm. in, you know, in the blogosphere and food sphere, as well as talking to me. And so, please, here is your chance to talk to three wise men and one very wise woman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, if you'd like to field questions through me uh, to any of us on the panel, one thing I'm sure of is all of us can talk. John Cook from the City UK. Um, I can't remember from your first slide of, of everybody you saw on the ethnographical research whether you saw regulators, and if so, what they thought. I mean, you mentioned that regulators <coughs> ought to be interested in all of this. After all, regulators and direct insurers give credit for reinsurance, and that's part of the calculations that they make on solvency. So what do they feel about the changes that you've observed? So that's quite interesting. I mean, I didn't deliberately target regulators. I wanted to understand how the market understood itself. Other than solvency too being a big issue for people at the time in terms of thinking about what they're going to do for their capital reserving, I can't say that regulation was at the centre of thinking. It's actually a very self-regulating industry, which I found quite an interesting feature to things. I think it's what Mike just alluded to. I think if we move down a more transactional space, so self-regulation, by which it you know, gets its own checks and balances and mutual skin in the game, will erode, and therefore we will have to have more scrutiny. Uh, so, you know, and I would have to say that now that the book is out, there probably is quite a lot more regulatory interest at looking at, oh, is that how the market works, and will it still work? Well, I haven't read your book, but I was very pleased to receive the first sort of discount when I ordered it online today. Uh, my name is Terry Hayden, I'm the non-executive director of the Lloyd's Agency. I just wondered what you felt was the significance of the brokers in the relationships that you described. And if there weren't any brokers, whether the relationships might have been different in some way between the insurers and reinsurers, where they sort of transacted business Yeah, I think actually that that is one of the things we just felt we couldn't deal with in the book in the end, because we spent a lot of time with brokers, and they're absolutely critical. 
And when you think about what is the role of a broker, is it an intermediary? It's to make capital flow. And in an industry where information was often quite fast, and you can see the sorts of ambiguities in this industry, uh, part of what brokers did was provide information to different parties to help the capital flow between them. Increasingly, as we move into this more commoditized space, I mean, the brokers themselves are under a lot of pressure. One of the interests slow and it wants to flow at a low price, then you know that becomes an important issue for them. Instead, I've also seen them have to put an enormous amount of work into upskilling their own technology because if they're going to front the capital instead of the reinsurance companies fronting the capital, then they're going to have to be the people who have the expertise. So I think there's been a really an enormous amount of change going on for them. But you know, maybe some of. So let me have a go at the broking world. I mean, principally, there's two things happening uh, in the broking world. On the one hand, there's the brokers who still very much believe. Uh, in a client-focused organization where if you're a large enough client, uh, you receive individual attention and we then syndicate the risk into the market or we place it with a single carrier or whatever is the appropriate measure. And then there's the other stream, um, which is uh, we bundle risk together, uh, similar risks, and we sell those into a market. And uh, this in the old days was known as a kind of a line slip type approach and today um, they, 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 they operate in the same way. Um, we still have to see whether they last um, uh, in the long term when compared to the traditional approach to syndicating risk uh, through, through understanding individual risks and accumulations of risks better and then, and, and, and then bringing them into the market. We have to see. Um, one of the big challenges I see with packaging business um, which, which which certainly some of the major brokers are doing now is for the insurers who write business on that basis to comply with solvency too. Uh, and uh, even bigger challenge, and you've touched on that, um, uh, is to be a non-executive director of an insurance board that writes large tranches of, of unknown business, uh, um, similar in nature but individually unknown risks. Um, to comply with Solvency 2 in today's world, uh, directors actually have to understand risk right down to basis level. And I'm not sure that they can do this in this new world that we're entering now. Um, at Lloyd's, uh, I don't know if we've got any kind of system, but at Lloyd's, the market share of the four big brokers in the reinsurance space is 72 percent. Now leave aside the U.S. norms of 40 percent is automatically an antitrust referral. It's 72 percent and that doesn't seem to bother the market. The market works very effectively with the help of the brokers who really act as the oil to take to get transactions actually done. So if I'm reinsuring Clem, I know Clem, I've met Clem, but the broker will tell me Clem wants this and this is why. I actually can calibrate that and help me make a decision. It works very good. In the primary space, we don't know the client. In fact, the broker probably owns all the knowledge about the client and in fact is trying to build up his expertise in the way the broker market is going. So we have a much different set of division, decisions to make if indeed, as Clem suggests, we're asked to take a portfolio of these decisions and they first prize, the broker probably wants to get rid of that pesky underwriter who just asks questions. You know, why be in the middle of a transaction? Because it'd be a lot easier if I could just marry this great amount of capital with this great amount of risk, and then we could just get it all on more efficiently. And I think that'll end in tears, much the way the mortgage-backed securities did. Because if you don't have somebody in the middle with some skin in the game helping to sort your portfolio, I don't think you'll have a very good portfolio over time. And so that's just
crisis is making with respect to capital that much cheaper, therefore I can push my price down. And the normal reaction of insurers has been to, as when prices are thin in a hard market, you do two things. One is you expand your portfolio, and boy, I can get all this lovely um, technical stuff from um, these uh, edge funds and so on. And B, you also expand the terms on which you're underwriting. So you start introducing access filters into your own rate of work and compensation. Mm -hmm. Now, if we go into a model where there is not the broker, there is this theoret theoretical perfection of precision in how the capital would respond. I'm very much afraid that those two things will follow. Uh, more risk and in thinner policies. I rather wonder what, uh, what Lloyd might think about that kind of possibility. So let's hold that one and let's get a question over here. Let's just get a couple of questions because we'd like to hear a few questions to hear. Let's get the flavour in the room. We'll have a few answers and then we can discuss some more over a couple of drinks. Yeah, thanks, Lloyd. That was brilliant. Um, I first want to ask for some advice about getting into the vortex because while you were, and Rebecca and Paul were in Monte Carlo and all the other cases, I was in the files of um, Prudential Archive, which is only part of Prudential, still in that building at High Holborn. So maybe I misjudged somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> but the proper question is to do with this. Um, Bill Maurer has this um, quite nice piece about how regulation can be read as an economic path back. Now, given the amount of emphasis you put on change in the reinsurance market, how do regulators respond to that without regulating things that the industry is already maybe away from? That's a great question. I don't have an answer, we'll hold that one. Did you have a question? Does anyone on that block want to have a question? Just a bit of balance in the room. Um, my name's Karina. I write for Trading Risk, which is a top one for the Trading Islands magazine. Um, there was a few things. It was just um, what I've heard is some of the bigger ILAP funds have um, sort of backed themselves by, by saying that the alternative capital is helping to create less volatility in the private debt. So I thought, is that not good? insurers in terms of giving them more stability in the pricing so they can find the next one up that is a different way of looking at it. And then the other thing is that uh, the, how they were saying that cap bonds are very targeted. I don't think that's the case. I mean, you get a lot of multi-sale bonds that cover the whole of the US or the entire continent, and there is a big move for stability, so there isn't necessarily those sort of things that interest triggers. And then the other thing I thought was um, the reliance on modeling. I just, I mean, the, it seems like the, the reinsurers themselves are also moving towards a big reliance on modeling as much as the ILS funds are to some extent from, from what I can see. And the last thing is that- That's cool. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I've got a chance to come back yeah. and some of these people here do. And should we just get one more question from someone? And I think it's just a one question, that's it. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I understand that. Perhaps you and I could have an interview later. It sounds like it's a story to tell. Yeah. Um, can, you, can you tell me what catastrophe bonds <laughs> are they a replacement of the reinsurance? Is it, is it alternative uh, uh, underwriter would, for example, take on risk? <coughs> he would want to get rid of part of this risk. So instead of going to a reinsurer, he would buy, he would issue bonds, would he? Yes. Yes. And how, how what's the lifetime of a bond? That can vary according to terms and bonds, but so actually what you'd like is to know a bit more about bonds and how they work. Uh, so perhaps again that's something we can come back to. Should we just go to some of these questions now and just maybe if you guys want to just dump some of your thoughts, I mean, from everything from ethnographic objects and you know, to, to on some of the questions that we've just had. Some of these things we aren't going to be able to fully answer because I think we'd like to get out and see within five minutes and have a drink. For those of you who do have serious questions for me, and I understand some people may have that because they're not quite sure what I've said about ILS, I'm very happy to have a talk with you a little bit later. This might not be quite the place to have that full discussion. 
Uh, which, but let's have a little bit of talk about these questions. Well, let me start with the LMX question um, from the old underwriter. I'm also an old underwriter. There's old underwriters and there's bold underwriters. And there's so many old, bold ones. So I see you were a sensible one through these, these, these markers. You're absolutely right. LMX was around price compression, and each time the wheel turned, the brokers took another 10 to 15 percent, and the underwriter who ended up at the end uh, might have ended up with 30 percent of the of the premium at the top of the spike. It's a little crazy. Um, uh, how we in uh, in my world prevented these kind of things from happening, and yeah, I'm going to refer to Tom's comment about skinning the game is that we said underwriters, their job is to underwrite risk and we hold that risk. What we do with the risk afterwards, nothing to do with any underwriter. Uh, they take outputs from a model, but it's not only the model, it's not driven by the model, it's also an underwriting decision. So we principally separate modeling from underwriting, from syndication of risk. It's not the same, it's not the same people. And that's a little different to that world that existed back then in the LMX where you could have a guy taking on a risk in Lloyd's, passing it out the back door, gets passed to someone else, by Friday next week it was back to him and he didn't even know that he got it. That, I think, <laughs> happens less because of separation of functions within organizations. As someone who has to deal with this every day, I, we have two things we do. One is we monitor who uh, the syndicates that Lloyd's buy the insurance from. We monitor what percentage is bought internally. <coughs> and we actually look at the reinsurance transactions in the form of the reinsurance resume they have to give us every year as they start the year. And then we also take a look at the purchase of uh, market loss warranty, and alternative cat bond, similar structures, although our, our syndicates buy reinsurance maintain energy maintenance and downstream benefits from parents buy bonds. But we tend to look at how much we have at risk because of the risk factor, because most of the bonds or the industry loss warranties have a basis risk in it, and we want to understand how much the syndicates have exposed where they may not be able to collect. If you look, there were quite a few <coughs> 20 billion market loss, northeast windstorm uh, losses, which in Superstorm Sandy, uh, they still haven't paid out because PCS says the loss was 18.6 billion. So that gives you an idea of how you can have a risk factor and not uh, collect. So we, we actually track that amount of risk factor and adjust what we are looking at the credit for on the reinsurance front. And we monitor very closely who, who's buying what with whom. So it's unlikely you can have what happened in the spiral happen again. It's not unlikely if you go to an unregulated world where you're just trading bonds and, and the rest. That could be a, a, a spiral, but they, the thing that I think is a key difference with most financial markets and financial risk takers is they kept track of their aggregates. So even if it's all going to swizzle around, at least they know how much they have at risk in any given day, generally at two in the morning when they calculate the risk for the whole bank. And, and that's a different world than we had back when people were doing the spiral because people didn't quite understand their aggregates and they certainly didn't understand they were getting back two to 10% of their own risk when they put it into the market for a collection. Mike, would you yeah, like just to talk to, to the issue to, of regulation? Well, yeah, I think I'll, I'll take that. I mean, uh, I mean, I, I sort of see that the book is raising sort of larger thematic issues as well as being specifically about this industry. But uh, um, it's certainly true that uh, the history of regulations, the history of residues and past accidents, we, we, we kind of know that. But I think um, I think Mr. Carney and Mr. Osborne announced uh, this week or maybe last week that. Uh, they were going to shift the focus of regulation from basically balance sheets to behavior uh, tangible. I mean, we'll see if that happens, but that seems to be the, the, the only way that one's going to kind of get ahead of the game as a regulator. And of course, this book uh, is sort of rich enough, it, it, it exactly describes the, the kind of complexities of, uh, of real practices of risk taking, which uh, a regulator who takes that step forward towards behavior is going to have to internalize in some way. You know, do the regulators have the kind of supervisors capable of uh, sort of internalizing some of this stuff? No, at the moment, because we're, you know, we're focused on balance sheet strength and we'll, we'll continue to do so. But I think there are kind of very significant messages for uh, aligning the regulatory style with the nature of the market behavior that you are trying to regulate. 